So warm, warmly welcome. My name is uh, Stefan Gustafsson. I'm uh, working for Apolo Apologia, Center for Christian Apologetics, which is a Christian, uh, Christian apologetic ministry here in Sweden. It has grown out from the IFES movement. Uh, and, and I uh, have a long, long uh, history with, with IFES and love to work with, uh, with students. And we, uh, we train Christians in Christian apologetics and we do uh, apologetic outreach. Unfortunately, uh, most of what we do are in, in Swedish. So our website and our books and so on are mainly for those of you who read the beautiful language of Swedish. Already Buddha said, all of life is suffering. And uh, that is really true. Everybody suffers, but in horribly unequal and unjust proportions. So everyone have to deal with suffering and also with the question of the unfairness in the distribution of suffering. Some people suffer comparatively less and others have to carry on horrible sufferings. Now, interestingly, suffering, that is really the home ground for the Bible. You know, in, in the Bible, there is a book called Lamentation. So many of the Psalms are laments. And at the very center of the Bible, we have a lonely man in horrible anguish screaming out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And of course, we have a whole book, the book of Job, 42 chapters dealing with suffering. So <clears throat> the Christian faith has a lot to say about suffering. And today we are going to limit ourselves to what we can learn from the book of Job. Now, let me first say very clearly, some questions have clear cut answers. If you ask me, how many euros do I have on a certain bank account? There is an exact answer and it's possible to have access to that answer. Many other questions do not have that kind of clear cut, easy accessible answers. It's more like you have to discuss it from different perspectives. If you ask a political question like, why did Donald Trump win the election 2016 in the US. You have to discuss that from many different perspectives in order to understand the, the trends and political movements and the atmosphere and so on uh, in the US at the time. When it comes to suffering, it's not like the question of the euro. It's suffering is such a complex issue. And the Bible does not give us one simple answer, but we are given a number of perspectives all the way from the fall in Genesis 3 to the recreation of the whole universe uh, in Revelations uh, 20, um, 22. And today we're limiting our discussion to one perspective. So there's so much more to say. We are going to discuss the perspectives we find in the book of Job. And Job is, of course, a very, very interesting figure. He lives in the country of Uz, that means he's a Gentile. But at the same time, he is fighting with the God of Israel. There's no tabernacle, there's no temple, there's no sacrifices. And Job, except for <clears throat> uh, one place in chapter one, he does not use the name of God, Yahweh, except for when he's saying the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away, may the, norm, uh, may the name of the Lord be, be blessed. Otherwise, he's just using the, uh, the normal word for God. But it is the God of Israel he's wrestling with because it is Yahweh who speaks to him in the last chapters of the book. So here we have a man outside the covenant people of Israel wrestling with the God of Israel. What kind of story is it? Before we try to draw some lessons, we need to understand what kind of story and book it is. It is, a, is it a retelling of historical events? Well, later books in the Bible seems to take Job as a historical figure. In Ezekiel and in the New Testament, the, the book of James, 
uh, he is put alongside with historical figures like Daniel. So there seems to be a real person and a real history in the background. At the same time, this is a great literary work. It's very much like a drama, a play. And maybe we should think about the book of Job as sometimes movies have this line. It's based on a true story. But of course, at the same time, it is a dramatization of some real events and some real historical persons, maybe like Shakespeare did with real kings and real leaders and real situations, but he put them in the form of a drama. And of course, uh, he fictionalized quite a lot. I think it's somewhere along those lines we should view the book of Job. The, <clears throat> the structure of the book of Job is quite clear, very interesting and very unusual. There is a prologue, an introduction, horrible, horrible disasters befells Job. And as a result, Job laments five screaming why in chapter three. Why has this happened? And then between chapter four and chapter 27, it's just dialogues. Three acts with Job's friends Eliphaz and Bildad and so forth, they are speaking and Job is answering. Then there is put in kind of wisdom poem. And then a new friend arrives at the scene and Job is talking, this new friend is talking, Eliu. And then finally God breaks in and he speaks. And then there is an epilogue where Job is restored. So as we can see from this outline, there is a lot of talking going on really a lot of talking. Nine speeches by Job, three speeches by Eliphaz, three by Bildad, two by Sofer, one wisdom poem, maybe by the author, four speeches by Elihu and two speeches by God. So that means 24 speeches altogether. That's a lot of words. And it's quite challenging reading for many different reasons. One of the reasons is that a lot in the book is falsehood. That is God's evaluation. When the Lord turns up at the end of the book, he said to Eliphaz of Tema, I'm angry with you and with your two friends. Why? Because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job. So a lot of the speeches contains misleading half truths. So you cannot just open the book of Job and quote and say, this is the word of God. Well, it is the word of God in one sense, but not in the sense that everything that is said is true. On the contrary, God judged it to be false. So therefore it's a book that needs to be studied carefully and be, to be studied in the full context of the whole book where it all leads. So, Let's take a look at the book. <clears throat> it starts, in the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He was not <clears throat> sinless. No one has been sinless except Jesus Christ. But this was not a man living in sin. He was a man who, who feared God and shunned evil. And he was highly respected. He's presented as the greatest man among all the people of the East. So people ele elevated him. He's a kind of ideal figure. And then disaster happens. Job lost, lost all his wealth, all his animals. His many servants were killed, murdered. His children, 10 in total, died because of a catastrophe. And he lost his health including his appearance, he lost everything except his own life. So it's disaster and tragedy and suffering one after the other. Now, I said he lost everything except his life. He didn't lose his wife. 
but it does not seem to be a very good wife. She is not of much help. His wife says this. When all this tragedy has happened, his wife says, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. That's not very helpful counseling. She says, curse God and then take your life. Now, Job's wife disappears from the story. So now Job is alone. Viktor Frankl, famous for his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he has written, forces beyond your control can take away everything you possess, except one thing, your freedom to choose how you will respond to the situation. That is exactly the position we find Job in. He's lost everything, except he has the freedom to choose how he now will respond to this situation. <clears throat> so we are drawn into here a story where human suffering is drawn to its extreme. Both moral evil has happened, people have killed his servants, and natural evil has happened, and natural catastrophe has killed his children. And the rest of the book is a kind of thought experiment where they debate how God rules the world. How can we put God into the picture in a world that works like this, where a man like Job can be confronted with a catastrophe such as this? John Walton, a, a very well-known Old Testament scholar, uh, he has said, <clears throat> that we can, we can think of a triangle as a tool to help us understand the discussion between Job and his friends who, who comes to help him. A triangle has three corners, and each corner can represent a certain claim. One corner is God's justice. One corner is Job's righteousness. And the third corner is the principle of retribution, the principle of karma, the principle of sowing and reaping. Now, in the debates between Job and his friends, they choose to have one of the corners as their starting point, their foundation, and then they look at the other two. And both of them cannot be true. So then they have to exclude one of them in order to affirm the other. And Job, Job's friends start with the principle of retribution. That's their starting point. And then they look at the, the other corners. And of course, they have to say, we cannot deny God's justice. God is God. He must be just. Therefore, we have to deny Job's righteousness. So that will be their line of argumentation. They start with the doctrine of retribution. They can, of course, not question God's justice. So then they have to question Job and his righteousness. And gradually, they start to accuse him. Firstly, more mildly, but gradually, more and more aggressively. You suffer for your sins. You have brought this upon yourself because of what evil you have done. The solution is to come clean, to repent, to open tell what you have done and ask for forgiveness. So one of the friends Eliphaz says, is it for your piety that he, God, rebukes you and brings charges against you? Is not your wickedness graced? Are not your sins endless? So their explanation is, you have an extraordinary amount of sins. That's why you have, you're suffering this extraordinary suffering. Now, that's horrible accusations for a person in pain. Job's response to this in the book is that he mourns, he laments, he cries over his situation. He claims his innocence. Not his sinlessness, but his innocence. He has not committed a grave sin. 
that had caused this to happen. If he looked at his life before the tragedy and his life now, it's not that he has made a number of choices that can explain what has happened. So he swears an oath of inno innocence. And he becomes increasingly, of course, angry with his friends in sensitivity, how they can accuse him this way when he's suffering. And he speaks to God. He turns to God. His friends does not. They only speak to, to Job. But Job, he also had the dialogue with God. And of course, he's looking for answers. Why has this happened? God, why has this happened to me? And in the end, he wants a trial against God because he starts to accuse God. God is unfair. And he wants to, wants to put God at a trial. So the debate goes back and forth. Job also accepts the principle of retribution. He claims his own righteousness, so he questions God's justice. After many, many, many speeches, the debate and dialogue just uh, collapses. No one has anything more to say, and they have not uh, solved the question. Then a new friend arrives at the scene, Elihu. He has been listening, but he's very dissatisfied, both with Job and with the three friends. And uh, he joins. So it says in chapter 32, so these three men stopped answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. But Elihu becomes very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. He was also angry with the three friends because they had found no way to refute Job and yet had condemned. So now he enters the situation and thinks he can explain it. And Elihu also takes his starting point in the doctrine of retribution, the same as the other friends. But he gives it a new twist. He gives it a new twist. Suffering reveals Job's self-righteousness. Job, he thinks, has, has pride in his heart. And that pride would, in the future, uh, produce sin. So in order to prevent Job from this pride and, in the future, the consequences of that pride in falling into sin, God has sent this suffering. So the suffering is God's help to Job to avoid worse sins in the future and to reveal his pride and help him to repent from that. That's Elihu's perspective. Now, the most dramatic, dramatic thing happens. After Elihu has uh, given his talks, God breaks into the discussion. God speaks to Job. And God accuses Job's friends and says, you are wrong. And he affirms Job. But in a very, very surprising way. Job has asked so many questions, why God? And when God comes and starts to speak, he does not give any answers, but he gives new questions. He asks 77 new questions and throw them at Job. And the point of all these questions is to help Job to see the difference between the creator and a little creature, between God and a human like Job in relationship to the fullness of creation. And behind those questions, it is this question from God's side. Is a trial between you and me really a good idea? What do you think you will win by uh, demanding a trial? God invites by, with all, uh, by the, all those questions, he invites Job on something we cannot do now in the pandemic, he invites Job on a journey around the world. 
and he travels imaginary with Job all through creation, through every aspect of the beauty of this world. The sun, the stars, the rain, the wind, the snow, and all the wonderful and fascinating animals. And he asked Job, can you create the world like this? Can you run the world like this? Do you have the wisdom? Do you have the power to do what I am doing? Can you compete with this? And then God gives a second speech. And there he focuses in a very playful presentation on two fearsome animals called Behemoth and Leviathan. And again, the question is the same. If you win the trial, how will you handle those animals that are so much stronger and so much bigger than you? Do you even have the power to do that? So Job, is a trial against God really a good idea? As a little aside, there's, there's two animals. There's a long description, very poetic description of those fearful animals called Behemoth and Leviathan. And of course, Bible readers have struggled with what, what kind of animals are these? Is it, is it a crocodile? Is it a hippo? Is it a, even a dinosaur? But you know, the animal have flames, fire from its mouth and smoke from its nostrils. Actually, no living animals today and no extinct animals ever have had fires from the mouth and smoke from the nostrils. These are mythological creations, symbols that were very common in the culture when the book was written, so people understood it. And God uses those mythological images to say, do you have the power over this? To translate it into our time, we have kind of mythologies around multiverses, that there are many, many parallel universes to ours. If God were to speak in our time, maybe he would challenge some of us saying, can you create a universe like this? Can you create the multiverse with worlds beyond worlds beyond worlds? That would be a similar uh, way of communicating for God to emphasize who he is as the sovereign creator. Okay, back to, to um, the book. After God has finished his speak, Job is really happy. Why? Of course, because God has come to him. What a grace to meet God in person. And God speaks to Job without accusing him. So he really affirms Job. And God assures him of his sovereign power, of his wisdom, and therefore that he has not given up the situation. So Job rejoices, even though he has not been given an answer. One thing he regrets, and that thing is a key to understand the book. Job has accused God of being unjust. He has said, God has wronged me. God has denied my rights. So he has been accusing God's justice. And now he understands that he has been talking about things he does not know. He's made exactly the same mistake as his friends. They accused Job without knowing, saying, you have sinned, but they have no knowledge of his sins. And Job has been really angry about them talking about things they do not know. But Job realizes he has been talking about God, about things he does not know. So Job says, surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Now, as you have noticed, I've not commented on the prologue, how the whole story begins, that there is a scene in the heavens of the accuser coming. And the, the reason why I've not said anything about that is that that scene was never disclosed for Job. We as readers know about it, but Job didn't know that the accuser had come before God and said, 
no one loves you, God. They only love your gift, what you give to them, not who you are. And Job is drawn into a challenge between God and Satan. And he can win a victory for God, but he does not know about this situation. We as readers know it, but Job was never told. Now, both Job's friends and Job, they have started with the principle of retribution. Job's friends have said, okay, we cannot question God's justice, so we must question Job's righteousness. Job took the same starting point, the principle of retribution, and he said, I'm righteous. So then I need to question God's justice. But both groups uh, are having the same starting point, and that is the problem. What should be questioned is the principle of retribution, the law of karma, of sowing and reaping. And what the book teaches us is that there is a much bigger picture that needs to be added. So we cannot think of our lives now as an immediate sowing and reaping, as an immediate law of karma. We must have a bigger picture. There is a spiritual world where things are going on that affects this world, like in the prologue. And we need to look at the future where everything will be <clears throat> restored. In the book of Job, he is restored at the end of the book. For many of God's people who are suffering, they are not restored in this world. But restoration will come in the eschatological uh, situation when Jesus comes back and everything is created anew. So we need to see our lives in the light of the spiritual world and in light of the future uh, and trust that God knows what he is doing in our present. So we lack knowledge of the whole of reality. We, of course, see our own life. We see our own suffering. And nothing of what I've said now is meant to diminish, diminishing any bit the suffering we can be within. But the book of Job teaches us that we just see a small part of what's going on. And therefore, it's not irrational or illogical to still trust God, even if we don't have any answers to why this or that is happening to me or to someone else. This follows naturally from the difference between the creator who sees everything and me as a, a small, fragile uh, creature who have a very, 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 very limited perspective. So, this is a complex world, and we, we know that from many areas, that is, it is a complex world. And of course, our lives is, is put into a context which is much bigger than just the physical world, the time and space continuum we are part of. There is also a spiritual world, and there is a future. In terms of the natural world, uh, we sometimes talk about the butterfly effect. That's a concept that has been used in, in chaos research regarding the uh, limited predictability of weather. And people sometimes take this, this example that if a butterfly moves its wings in China, it can cause a snowstorm in Sweden. Because there's so many intricate connections. It's such a complex web of things that the smallest thing in one place further along can cause something really big. And that is how we should think about our own lives. We are put into a world which is much, much, much more complex than what we can see now. And therefore, we should trust God also when we don't understand his dealing at, with us 
at a specific moment. So what is the, the lesson from the book of Job? It is that we should not, uh, we should not have our starting point in the principle of retribution as an immediate and coherent principle that regulates everyday life in this fallen world. That is the wrong starting point. That should be questioned. We should have our starting point in God's justice, in God's nature, in God's character, in God's love, and then trust God. Also in those periods when we ourselves are walking in darkness.